Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Dr. Richardson, and I'm one of the biology advisors at Cal State Northridge. And this video, we're very excited to bring it to you because we get a lot of questions about it, is about hospital laboratory careers, or you might call them clinical laboratory careers. Now, I want to start with a disclaimer that I've worked very hard to get this information. We've done our best to give you the basic information. I'm not an expert on these careers, but this should be a good starting point if you want to learn more about these jobs and information about how to get started. So, let's get started. There's a lot to discuss here. Um, I don't know how long the video is going to be, but uh, we've worked hard to get you some basic information. So, first of all, we are going to talk about, and there's many of them, many different career or job options. This might not be a full and exhaustive list, but as I said, we've done our best to give you some basic information. So let's start by talking about where these jobs are. 58% of these hospital or clinical lab jobs are in local, state, or private hospitals, working in the hospital. 17% of the jobs are in private labs, medical and diagnostic labs. Diagnostic meaning they're trying to diagnose something. Uh, sometimes these are called reference labs as well. And they are outside of a hospital in a private lab. And then a small number of the jobs are in physician offices. If they're large offices where they take a lot of samples, you know, blood and urine and things like that, these people might be working in physician offices. Now, the jobs uh, are in two main areas. We have clinical pathology and we have anatomic pathology. Clinical pathology are jobs where you're evaluating blood and other fluid specimens. Uh, urine, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, it might be fluid they've taken out of a cyst uh, or something like that. And anatomic pathology are jobs where you're evaluating tissue specimens. Might be skin, might be a tumor, um, might be liver or piece of a lung or something like that, but tissue specimens is anatomic pathology, whereas the clinical is fluid, blood and fluid. So let's start with the clinical pathology careers. And here are some of the names of these jobs. The big one that a lot of people ask us about and want is the CLS, also sometimes known as an MLS, clinical lab scientist or medical lab scientist. And that's the big one. And there are others, though. There are also limited license scientists. These are people who don't do all of the testing where the clinical lab scientist does all of the testing, whereas the limited license just does some of them. And you see the CHBB and micro. We're going to find out what those mean in a few minutes. Chemistry, hematology, blood banking, and microbiology. And the limited license in those four areas, you can get that job, or as the CLS or MLS, you're qualified to do all four of those areas. Now, a little below that uh, CLS or limited license scientist is the MLT, medical lab technician. Uh, that job is not as deeply involved as the CLS, but it's in the hospital lab. The MLTs work for and with the CLS and MLS people. There's a few others. Clinical genetic molecular biology specialist 
in the uh, state websites where you get your license, uh, they have the initials MB, molecular biology. But these people are also known as CGMBS, which stands for Clinical Genetic Molecular Biology Specialist. They might also be called Molecular Diagnostic Specialists, Molecular Pathologists, or Molecular Biologists. So there's uh, a lot of different names for this one. We'll talk a little bit more about what these different jobs are, what you're actually doing in a few minutes. There's also the cytogenetics with the um, CG designation, cytogenetics, and then there's a phlebotomist uh, with the initials PBT. Uh, phlebotomists draw blood. They're not doing the analysis or anything like that, they're just drawing the blood. So those, those are some of the clinical pathology careers that we're going to talk a little bit more about. On the anatomic pathology side, there are a couple jobs. Pathologist, this is usually someone who's like a coroner. They will uh, do the autopsies on dead bodies. This is a medical doctor. You have to go through medical school and residency to be a pathologist. But they also do studies on uh, tissue and things like that, things that they take out of people, like tumors and stuff like that. There's also the pathologist assistant uh, with the name Path A to differentiate them from PAs, which are physician assistants. These are pathologist assistants, and they assist the pathologist with doing uh, the work that they do. There's also cytotechnologists, CT, cytotech, and histotech, HTL, histotechnologists, and histologic technicians, HT. So as you can see, there's lots of different names. We are going to, as I said, go through a little bit more in detail about what each person does. All right. Now, Things to consider if this is a career that you're interested in. Much of the lab work now is automated. If you Googled uh, like YouTube to look at what uh, like a day in the life of a CLS, uh, you would see that they work a lot with machines. So they would draw the blood and then basically you put the test tube in a machine and it does all the work. So to go into this field, you must be comfortable and understand that you'll be working with a lot of complex machinery. Uh, these machines have to be quality controlled, meaning making sure they're accurately analyzing the blood or the urine or whatever it is. So there's a lot of quality control with the machinery that you have to do. There is no patient contact uh, unless you're a phlebotomist and you're drawing, actually drawing the blood. There's not any patient contact with these careers. So if your goal is to work with people and with patients, I'm not sure that this is the right area. They are looking for people uh, with very strong work ethics, must be very detail-oriented, very precise. They want people who are good communicators because you will be communicating with physicians and nurses uh, if, you know, the blood is drawn and taken to the lab or the urine and something is found, then you're going to be communicating with the doctors and the nurses about what you find. Sometimes there's just routine conversations you have with them, but sometimes if something is found, uh, they're more critical and sensitive conversations. So again, you have to be comfortable with technology and you have to be comfortable with blood and bodily fluids. It's not that you're going to be touching the blood or the urine. They'll all be usually in test tubes and things like that. But you do have to be comfortable with the fact that you're going to be working with blood and bodily fluids. Um, some of these... Uh, situations will be critical and life-saving. You know, there'll be tests that need to be done right away, stat tests, they have to be done quickly, accurately, precisely to find out if uh, certain illnesses exist. 
There is a lot of opportunity for travel. Uh, in my research, I found that there are certain areas of the state or the country where uh, these lab professionals are in great need. And so there are people who are traveling, uh, you know, clinical pathology people. They might work in California and then they might work in another state and they might travel around. So there is an opportunity to travel. And finally, this is a lot of shift work. You know, there's the day shift, the morning shift, the afternoon shift, the evening shift. And these people often work nights. I hear that especially when you're new and you're first getting into the job market, you might get the night shift and it might take time for you to work up to getting the perfect shift that you might want if you want to work during the day. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, get into this. So each of these jobs that we've mentioned have requirements that you have to meet in three basic areas. There's academic training requirements, then there's training requirements, and then there are exams to get licensed and then you go out and do the job. So academic requirements, training requirements, and then exams to get licensed. Okay, so we're going to talk next about what each of these job entails in more detail and cover the academic training and exam and licensure requirements. So we're going to start, of course, with the CLS. As I said, they might also be called an MLS and sometimes they use the term generalist. And the generalist uh, title means that the CLS conducts a full range of lab tests in blood banking, chemistry, hematology, immunology, microbiology, molecular biology, and urinalysis uh, tests on urine. And all of this work is to provide information necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Uh, the CLS is qualified in these four main areas, chemistry, hematology, blood banking, which is also often called immunohematology, and microbiology. In the chemistry area, uh, which is the most automated part of the lab. There are a full range of routine tests that are done on blood. BMP is a basic metabolic panel, electrolyte panels, lipid panels measuring like cholesterol and things like that, liver uh, and thyroid function panels. Uh, some of you may have had these tests uh, when you go to the doctor and they draw your blood already. So uh, there are, I would maybe say millions of these tests run every day in our country for people who are in the hospital, people go to the doctor's office and things like that. So chemistry, hematology, the most common tests run are the CBC, uh, this uh test, you know, your number of platelets in your hemoglobin and hematocrit, H&H &H in your blood, uh, white blood cells, and coagulation tests. Is the blood coagulating correctly? Uh, there's a lot of uh, diseases and disorders people could have that could affect their ability to coagulate their blood. So these tests are done, again, millions done every day. Blood banking or immunohematology that area uh, of work is about blood typing. You know, if someone uh, has an accident and they come into the hospital, you may have seen in the movies, you know, two pints of O negative blood, you know, and they're, they're giving people blood. Well, they always do blood typing tests to find out what type of blood a person has and make sure they're getting the right blood for a transfusion and things like that. And if you've taken... Uh, you know, physiology, you probably know that our blood cells have different antigens on them, and we have an RH factor that's like O negative or O positive blood. So the blood banking area uh, for the CLS 
is testing for all of that. You know, you might get a sample of someone's blood and you want to know their type, what antigens uh, are on their blood cells, and their Rh factor. Finally, there's microbiology. And this would be, maybe they're trying to find out if you have um, a certain bacteria in your blood. Uh, so blood and fluid cultures, you know, they might take a, f a throat culture if they think you might have strep throat, or sometimes they take a urine culture and things like that. Sometimes they culture the cerebrospinal fluid when they do a spinal tap. So this is where you're, you're really trying to find out if there are pathogens in blood and other fluid. So this is where, if you've taken a microbiology course, they do a lot of streaking of plates you know, they'll take that throat culture and they'll smear it on the plate and then they'll let it sit and see if something grows on it. So blood and fluid cultures. This area is the most hands-on because uh, you're going to be doing the streaking of the plates. So those are the major divisions of the CLS, also known as the generalist. And again, they're known as a generalist because they are trained in all of these areas, whereas a limited license person would only be trained in one area. So for the CLS, what education is needed? Remember, we have education, training, and then exam and licensure requirements. So to be the CLS, the education you need is a bachelor degree in a natural science. Uh, here at CSUN, we have the biology medical tech bachelors, and that's the one that people normally choose. You don't have to have the medical tech. You don't even have to necessarily be a bio major. It could be a chemistry major, but 99 times out of 100, it's biology major medical technology option. And the reason it's usually the medical technology bio degree is because all of these courses that are required are contained within our medical technology bachelor degree. So uh, you must have a natural science bachelor degree and you must also have these courses. 16 units of chemistry, including biochemistry and chemical analysis, which uh, is also called analytical chemistry. And you see the course numbers on the screen there. You also need 18 units of biology at least. And within those 18 units, you must have microbiology, hematology, immunology, and medical microbiology. And you see the CSUN course numbers on the screen. And finally, you need at least three units of physics. That's not a problem because in the bio major and the chemistry majors here, everyone takes uh, two semesters of physics. Now you notice here it says, or courses taken after graduation. And that's because we often get people contacting us who say, I already have my bachelor degree in biology, but I didn't take some of those, or I didn't take all of those. It is possible to take those courses after you graduate uh, to be able to qualify for the training programs which come next. So once you have the education, the degree, and the courses, then you would apply to a training program. And we've listed here the training programs in California and there's not a huge number of them. These are one-year programs, one-year training programs. There is a little bit of classroom work but the majority of these one-year programs is you in the lab learning how to become a CLS and to do all these duties that you do. Now keep in mind that each program may have additional entrance requirements to the training programs in addition to the courses. Most commonly, uh, an additional requirement is a minimum GPA. And I did a little bit of research. So for the Cal State LA program, minimum 2.75 GPA. For the Dominguez Hills, Cal State University Dominguez Hills, which is down near Long Beach, 
its 2.7 GPA and a B average, a B average in the courses listed here in the previous screen. And the UC Irvine program also requires a 2.7. So 2.7 seems to be common. I didn't check every single one in California, but the ones closest to us, about a 2.7. Another requirement they might have to get into the training program is a specific number of years since these courses were taken. Many of them might say you have to have these courses within the last five years or within the last seven years. And so that is an additional requirement you might see to get into the training program. Also, a final requirement is that students must get a trainee license before starting a training program. That's something you apply to through the state of California and you would have to apply and get the trainee license before you start the training program. These programs are very competitive mostly because they take a very small number of people every year. Finally, what about after the training program? Well, after the training program you take an exam to get your license and these the, the most common exam is the ASCP, I think it's American Society of Clinical Pathology, an ASCP exam, and that's if you completed a accredited program through the NAACLS. I know there's a lot of these abbreviations. Uh, I think this is National Accrediting Agency for Clinical Lab Science or something like that. So. Uh, if you go to a program for your training that's accredited by the NAACLS, then you usually take the ASCP exam. There's a couple other exams, AMT and AAB, that are other exams that can be taken, but from my research, I understand most people do the ASCP. Uh, if, however, you attended a program that is not accredited by NAACLS. There are some programs that are called independent programs. Then you would take the CA, California ASCP exam. I think you're starting to see how complicated this is, so I did my best to make sure this was accurate. And for these exams, there are study guide, practice exams, online review courses, a lot like if you're preparing to take the MCAT for med school or the DAT. So there are study guides and review courses to help you uh, get ready for the tests. So that's how you become a CLS. And uh, we're going to go into some of these other careers as well, but if you only want to know about CLS, you can stop the video now, or if you want to know more, you can keep watching. Uh, as I mentioned, we do often get people contacting us and say, I've already graduated, but I don't have the hematology, the medical microbio. So if someone has graduated but didn't take the required courses, you can take the courses after you graduate. However, you've got to be prepared because these courses are expensive. Here at CSUN, if you wanted to take, you know, hematology or medical microbio after you graduated, you're going to be paying four or five hundred dollars for every one unit. So if you need more than one courses, you could be talking about thousands of dollars. These courses are in great demand at CSUN. It's often very difficult to get into immunology or medical microbio at CSUN after you graduate. It's not impossible, but again, we want you to be prepared for understanding these courses are in great demand at CSUN. We often, when students can't get into the courses here, refer people to UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley online offers these courses online. There's never a problem with getting into them. The, the issue, though, is the courses don't have labs with them. It would be just the lectures. But if you read carefully the education requirements, it's not necessarily required that you have the lab for these courses, which is why UC Berkeley Online is a place to go 
if you need to take these courses and cannot get into them at CSUN. Uh, most recently, I had a student that said, look, is there any other way to get these courses done if it's so expensive and I don't have the money? Uh, and the only other option I could come up with in my mind is that if a student wanted to do a master's degree at CSUN in biology, you could potentially fit in the courses while you're earning a master's degree. Now, a master's degree here takes two or three years. It's a big commitment, conducting research, writing a thesis, defending your thesis. But master's degree students do get financial aid to help them pay for courses. And it is required that you take a number of courses, regular courses, along with your research and your thesis work. So that might be another option for people if money is a huge roadblock. Finally, um, I guess I shouldn't have told people to turn the video off, but this is a, uh, we get this question a lot. How do I become more competitive to become a CLS? And I've asked uh, several CLSs about this, and the number one thing that always comes up is take a phlebotomy course. If you become a phlebotomist, it, in some magical way, uh, makes you more competitive. Your foot is in the door. You're you're drawing blood and you know taking it to the lab. So you you kind of get your toe in the water. You can take a phlebotomy course uh, if you Googled. Uh, California accredited phlebotomy courses, you would find a long list of schools that offer a phlebotomy course. I've talked to a lot of students who have done that. So, and they're short-term courses, uh, a few weeks. So taking a phlebotomy course helps you be more competitive. Another idea would be to try to get an entry-level job working in a lab that trains CLS students. We had a student who graduated recently and did not get into the CLS training program. She got a job working in a lab where CLS students are trained and then got into a CLS training program. So uh, obviously, if you get a job, uh, the supervisors get to know you and can possibly help recommend you or advocate for you to get into a training program. Another suggestion might be to get a job working in a lab that processes specimens. You might not be aware, but there's two huge companies that process these specimens, LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics. You might see the vans uh, driving around the city, Quest Diagnostics. So getting a job perhaps working in a lab that processes these specimens. Again, anything to kind of get your foot in the door. And shadowing a CLS would be another one. I don't know how easy that would be. We do have a CLS here in the Klotz Health Center. And if you want to know more about trying to shadow her, I can't remember her name right now, uh, we can see what we can do to help you do that. Next, we have some names of some local labs that train CLS students. So if you say, well, I applied but didn't get in, or I want to make myself more competitive, first, here are some local labs that train uh, CLS students. The, the students who are in the Cal State Los Angeles and the Cal State Channel Island and the Cal State Dominguez Hills training programs work while they're in the training program, get trained at these labs. So, for example, Quest Diagnostics in West Hills, all of you UCLA in Silmar, uh, Children's Hospital LA, and even the Northridge Medical Center. I don't know how easy it would be to get an entry-level job, but again, we're just trying to give you some information for uh, you to move towards what you want to do. All right, next would be the limited license. And again, if you're a limited license scientist, you're certified in only one area of the clinical lab. So just the chemistry, analysis on blood and body fluids, just the hematologist, 
performs tests on blood only, coagulation disorders, and looking at red blood cells and uh, aiding in the diagnosis of any blood diseases. Just the blood banking, BB, the immunohematologist, routine and specialized tests in blood banking and transfusion, making sure people are uh, getting the right blood in transfusion. And just the microbiologist, uh, doing the streaking of plates and identifying bacteria and microorganisms in the body fluids. So a limited license, again, you're not trained in all four of these, but just one area. What kind of education do you need for that? Well, we've listed that here for the clinical chemistry training. You need a bachelor degree in chemistry or equivalent major. Biology would be okay, as long as you have 25 units of chemistry, including the chemical analysis, Chem 321. Uh, if you're in the biology major, 5, 10, 15, 19, uh, 23, 27, you would get 25 units of chemistry as long as you take biochemistry and the chemical analysis. For the hematology uh, training programs, you need the bachelor degree in biology. You must have 25 units of biology along with Bio 487, which is our hematology class. Makes sense. For the blood banking immunohematologist, bachelor degree in biology or equivalent, 25 units of biology, including genetics, Bio 360, and immunology, Bio 485. And for the clinical microbiologist, bachelor degree in biology or microbiology, 25 units of biology, including medical microbio, which is our 410. So the limited license uh, training is here. I did my best to find the training programs they were uh, a little harder to find than uh, the CLS programs, but here you see the training programs in chemistry, immunohematology, microbiology. As you can see, UCLA is a big one. Uh, Children's Hospital, LA, Cedar sinai City of Hope, Henry Mayo, uh, Quest Diagnostics. So these are programs that are certainly around here. I couldn't find any for hematology only. So again, for the limited license, the education, the training, and then the exam to get your license. And again, it's the ASCP exam. But again, these are limited license exams. It's a different exam than the CLS takes. Okay. How about MLT, medical lab technician? This person collects and processes the specimen. In the same areas, blood banking, chemistry, hematology, immunology, microbiology, they work with the CLS, but they have less training, less responsibility. Uh, so in a way, kind of like uh, someone who assists the, the doctor. Um, so that's what they do. Less training, less responsibility. How much education do they need? MLT only needs an associate degree. If you have a bachelor's, does that mean you cannot be an MLT? No, it's just that the education required is only an associate degree. What about the training for MLT? Well, because only an associate degree is required, that's where the training programs are. COC up in Valencia and Mount Sac Community College, which is about an hour east of here. And these are our local training programs for MLT. They also take an ASCP exam after their training program. So the ASCP has all these different licensing exams for the CLS, for each of the four limited license, for the medical lab tech. What about the CGMBS? 
Well, these people use blood and cells to perform molecular tests, and they're looking for acquired or inherited diseases to help physicians diagnose uh, problems. Maybe cancer, uh, metabolic uh, illnesses, things like diabetes or thyroid problems, infectious diseases. Examples of tests include PCR, uh, DNA or RNA isolation or cloning, genome sequencing of bacteria and viruses like COVID tests, uh, genome sequencing to identify inherited conditions. Uh, the BRCA gene is a breast cancer gene or hypercholesterolemia, people who have uh, high cholesterol. Uh, that can be an inherited um, disorder. And they also do tests uh, for tumor profiling to, if someone has a tumor, checking out uh, the DNA of the tumor to help determine an effective treatment. So this is what the CGMBS or Molecular Diagnostics employee does. How about education? Well, to do this, bachelor degree. No specific courses required. That's good news. What about training? Again, there's a training program. Here's our local uh, California training programs. Again, UCLA, Cal State LA, Children's Hospital LA would be the ones closest to us. And once again, once the training is over, there's a licensing exam with the ASCP. How about cytogeneticist? These people prepare samples and perform chromosomal analysis uh, to assist again in diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment <coughs> excuse me, of genetic diseases resulting from uh, maybe an abnormal number of chromosomes. They also perform tests to visualize and study chromosome structure, karyotyping, chromosome staining, and FISH. I learned about that 20 years ago, but I can't remember what FISH stands for. But these are some of the specialized tests that the cytogeneticists do. Of course, there's some education required, more generic, bachelor degree, 25 units of biology and chemistry, easily acquired with any biology degree at CSUN or chemistry or biochemistry. Once you have the education, there's the training. Again, you see the UCLA, the Children's Hospital, City of Hope. Again, it's not like a pharmacy school where there's a huge number of schools. These are uh, small training programs in very specific places. But again, once you're finished with the training, licensing exam, ASCP, go out and get a job. Finally, with the um, clinical pathology careers would be the phlebotomist. These people, all they do is draw the blood and process the sample for testing. Just drawing the blood. What education do you need? Just a high school diploma to become a phlebotomist. Does that mean you can't become a phlebotomist if you have a bachelor degree? No, it's just that all you must have is a high school diploma. California Department of Health, I mentioned this earlier, maintains a website of approved training programs, and they are very short-term programs, usually have about 40 hours of lecture and about 50 hours of externship. Uh, where you get the, the book learning about it, and then they put you in a hospital or an area where you get the experience, and then you also must perform a minimum number of blood draws to become a phlebotomist. And as I said, the California Department of Public Health has a website where you could find out where the phlebotomy training programs are. Lots of them, lots of them.
in California. Okay? In fact, UCLA has one. Maybe even some community colleges, but you can check the list. And once the phlebotomist does their training, they take an exam. And there are several organizations that offer the phlebotomist licensure exam. ASCP is one of them. There are others as well. And then once you have your training, you pass your certifying exam, then you send off your paperwork and you get your license and then you go out and get a job. All right, we're almost there. There's more. Now we're going to talk about the anatomic pathology careers again three basic requirements. There's academic requirements, training, and then exams to be licensed. And again, we're going to go through what each job entails and the academic training and licensure requirements for each. So at the top would be the pathologist. Uh, this person contributes to diagnosing and prognosis and treatment through the knowledge gained by the lab tests that are done. Uh, pathologist also gathers info through microscopic examination of tissue, specimens, cells, body fluids uh, to diagnose disease. These pathologists usually work in hospitals and they might be investigating the effects of disease on the human body through autopsies, cutting dead bodies, and then examining tissue cells and other specimens. Um, and to be kind of the lab director of the whole hospital lab, those people are usually pathologists. And again, to be a pathologist, you have to have a bachelor degree, pre-med courses, and you have to have a medical degree, the MD or the DO degree. Once you finish your education, then you go to residency, four years of residency in pathology after med school. And then you must get the license that the physicians get, which is the USMLE or the COMLEX exams. So those are the exams that one takes in medical school and residency to become licensed. And then when you finish your residency, you are then board certified as a pathologist. And there's exams you have to take for that. So that's the long route right there. Pathologist assistant. This is, might be something you've never heard of before. Uh, there are not a huge number of training programs for this. Um, in 15 years, I don't know that I've ever uh, advised a student who wanted to be a Path A, but uh, here's some info about that. This person would provide services under the direction and supervision of the pathologist. So they process the lab specimens. They also perform the post-mortem after death examinations, autopsies, assisting the pathologist with gathering the tissue and the specimens and things like that. And they are often responsible path assistants for supervising lab technicians, writing and reviewing surgical pathology and autopsy notes, and maybe also inventory control and lab operations. So the pathologist and the path A. To be a path A, you need a bachelor degree and then a master's degree, master's degree to be a path A. And as you can see, there's not a lot of training programs. I mean, there are 170 med schools, 170 pharmacy schools in the United States, but you see very small number of path A training programs. And the closest would be Loma Linda here in California. It's about an hour east of here. As with all the others, once you do your education and your training, then you take an exam, ASCP. Cytotechnologists. 
These uh, people evaluate cell samples under a microscope from all body sites, looking for precancerous changes, cancer, tumors, infectious disease. The job may involve the preparation of the samples unless that lab has histotechnologists who perform that work. So cytotech might also be uh, preparing the samples. Uh, a, a huge part of what a cytotech does is pap smears. Uh, you ladies know what a pap smear is. It's taking a sample of the cervical tissue to confirm there's no cervical cancer and millions of pap smears done in the United States every day, I'm sure. FNA, fine needle aspirations. If someone has a tumor, they might Take, stick a needle in and pull some of the cells out to check those out. Other medical procedures. I found a cool article focusing on cytology that tells more about it. And if you're interested in this, you could also look up the ASCT, American Society for Cytotechnologists. Again, education required, bachelor's degree, somewhat generic, 20 units of bio, eight units of chemistry, three units of math, doesn't have to be any specific courses, just the degree. And then training programs. These training programs are accredited through KAHEP, C-A-A-H-E-P, California uh, Council for Accrediting Agency Health. I don't can't remember what it's for, what it stands for, but in California, we have two programs for Cytotech, Loma Linda and UCLA. One year training program. After the training program, licensing exam ASCP. Histotechnologists, histotechnicians, and histologic technicians. This was an area that got a little bit muddy because there's different names and uh, I, I was really searching to find out and define what each does. So the histotechnologist prepares and performs uh, samples for routine and some complex tests. Uh, enzyme histochemistry, immunohistochemistry, and immunofluorescence test on tissue samples. Again, they're looking to identify um, what's going on in the tumor. Uh, are there certain um, antibodies or enzymes uh, within these tissue samples to help diagnose disease? It seems to me that the histotech and the histologic technician are kind of a, a need less experience than the histotechnologist. They prepare and process the samples that the histotechnologist will then perform the tests on. So uh, you might be seeing a lot of this uh, kind of this tiered system. You know, the histotech and the histologic technicians work under the histotech. The path assistant works under the pathologist, etc. Again, found another article, uh, here, a couple articles about histotech if you want to learn more. If you'd like this PowerPoint, send us an email. We're happy to send it to you. Education for the histotechnologist. Uh, all it said was a person needs a biology and chemistry focused bachelor degree. So biology degree, chemistry, biochemistry would be fine. For the histotechnician or histologic tech, all that's required is an associate degree, including 12 units of biology and or chemistry. Could you become a histotech with a bachelor? Yes, it's just that you don't have to have one. Again, training programs. I put the website here where you can find uh, other training programs, but in the SoCal area, uh, in California, I found Mount Sac, again, east of here in the city of Walnut. UCLA, again, Cedar sinai again, City of Hope. You've seen these a lot. There's lots of training programs going on at these places, and there's also UC San Francisco. Of course, again, exam. 
all of these jobs require education, training, and exam to be licensed. Wow, that was a big one. Um, I put some links here to find out more. Um, the California Department of Health is the body that states what education, training, and licensure a person must have. We have a career page with the ASCP to learn more about. This is where I did a lot of my research. Um, there was a nice um, website here, Who's Who in the Medical Lab, where you can read more about these jobs. Um, career questions to ask, a YouTube video, and Reddit. Many interesting threads about these careers. Now, I'm not endorsing Reddit. It's everybody's giving their opinion, but some uh, I've read some of them and they were fascinating and interesting. Okay, I know that was a long one. Hope it was helpful. We have a huge passion for helping young people to know about their career options and point, you know, giving them basic info and then showing them where to go to find out more. Okay? We'll see you next time.